Welcome to the memory unit. In this video, we'll cover the processes of memory, structures of memory, and memory as an active process. I've updated the Psyboost app. Now it has over 500 GCSE flashcards, over 400 multiple choice quiz questions, and over 300 key terms to test your knowledge with. Of course, all based on the information I cover in these videos. I'm so confident you'll like my app. You can use all the features for Paper 1 for free, only subscribe to Paper 2 if you know you'll find it helpful. You can also follow along with these videos by completing my worksheets, available on Patreon. Processes of memory. The whole idea of memory being a process is it's simply information flowing through a system. Think about it like this. Your teacher tells you a fact. Your senses, in this case your ears, detect information from the environment, the words. After you detect that information, you have to store it somewhere. And then at some point, like your exam, you're going to need to take the information out of storage and actually use it. That's the process. That's the information flowing through the system. The type of psychologists who explain how information flows in mental systems are called cognitive psychologists. We need to know the word encoding. This is simply changing the form of information as it comes in so it can be stored in the brain. So you have mental imagery that's stored visually. That inner voice, no, you're not crazy, everyone's got one. That's acoustic memory. The last one, semantic, is a little tricky. Uh, the information is in the form of meaning. Donald Trump, it's just a name, right? Well, chances are that name has meaning to you. It's linked to a bunch of general knowledge facts. Facts that jump to my mind are he has unusual hair, he wants to build a wall, and occasionally hugs flags. Oh, and he thinks ejecting bleach is kind of a good idea. Um, those are the general knowledge facts that link to my memory. They're semantic memories. Storage is a word you're probably very familiar with. And in this context, we're just applying it to how your brain, made of neurons, manages to keep all of that information sometimes for your entire life. Retrieval is getting that information stored by those neurons back and then using it, which is output. Let's make a distinction between two types of memory, short-term memory and long-term. Now lots of information comes into the senses every second, but you don't pay attention to most of it. What you do pay attention to is held in your short-term memory. It doesn't last long, about 18 seconds. And when you're holding it there, like a phone number, chances are your inner voice is repeating it. So acoustic encoding. But information that's in short-term memory can be put into long-term memory. You could rehearse information in short-term memory by saying it again and again, and that's maintenance rehearsal, or by giving it meaning known as a laboratory rehearsal. What were the four words I put next to Donald Trump's name? Bleach, hair, wall, flag. A laboratory rehearsal. Now we need to break down long-term memory into three distinctive types, episodic, semantic, and procedural. Episodic memories are how you remember your personal experience, those things that have happened to you. So if I ask you to remember your first day at high school, you're recalling an episodic memory. You can tell it consciously and you could describe it to me in words. Semantic memory is memory for facts and meanings. So if I ask you what the word elephant means, you could consciously recall what the word means and put it to me in words. A very different type of memory is procedural memory. These memories are for skills, like how to ride a bike or tie a shoelace. These memories are actually really difficult to put into words, and we would call them non-declarative. So let's look at some evaluations for the types of long-term memory. Now we can find support for episodic and semantic memories being separate processes with the work of a psychologist called Tolving. I'm going to go into detail on the study in a future video, so let me just give you the basics. Tolving injected people and himself with a radioactive form of gold. You can detect that gold in the brain on a PET scanner, and that shows what part of the brain is active and what part of the brain is not active. Now, whereas participants thought of episodic memories, areas of the brain in the frontal and temporal lobe lit up. When they thought of semantic memories, areas in the parietal and occipital lobes lit up. As different types of memory use different brain regions, this suggests that they're separate processes. And then if we look at procedural memory, the case study of HM shows us it's separate from episodic and semantic memory. 
HM had his hippocampus removed to stop epileptic seizures. He lost the ability to make new episodic and semantic memories after the surgery, but not procedural. A final and critical evaluation is, it might be a little simplistic to simply classify long-term memories as just one type. Often memories are complex combinations, so a child remembering to tie his shoelaces because his mother told him so needs semantic memory for the word shoelaces, episodic memory to remember that he's been told, and the procedural memory for how to actually tie them. Structures of memory. This diagram is called the multi-store model. You're going to want to remember this diagram inside now. So when I finish talking you through it, pause the video and draw on some scrap paper until you can do it from memory. It was created back in 1968 by Atkinson and Schifrin, two cognitive psychologists. They use this model to describe how information is processed in your mind. They identified three memory stores, sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. So let's talk about the process quickly. You take in a massive amount of sensory information every single second. Sight, sound, touch, taste, smells. That all enters into your brain, but you don't pay attention to most of it. And it's just lost. What you do pay attention to is passed to the next memory store, short-term memory. There it's held on to, but not for long. That information is either lost or it's processed and then passed to long-term memory. That processing is called rehearsal, and there are two types. Maintenance, so you might repeat a name again and again and again to learn it. Or elaborative, this is when you think about the meaning of what you're trying to remember. You may think how that new fact you just learned in class is linked to other things that you know. Now information is in long-term memory. Now it can be lost, but if we want to use the information in long-term memory, we need to be able to bring it back into short-term memory. That's called retrieval. Now, what we need to know about these free stores are features. So we might be able to ask about how the information is coded, so uh, what form the information is, the capacity, so how much the store can hold, and the duration, so how long that store can hold information. Starting with the sensory register. Well, the information comes directly from the senses, and the way that information is stored depends on the sense. We would just call that kind of coding modality specific. Capacity is very large. It has to take in all the information from all the centers. But the duration, how long that information is held, is very short. It can be around 250 milliseconds. Moving to the short-term memory store. The coding is acoustic, so an inner voice. The capacity, so the number of items you can hold, seems to be very small. It's around seven items. So with some variability, some people can remember a little more or a little less. We say seven items plus or minus two. How long you can hold that information onto is very short, around about 18 seconds. Anything not passed to long-term memory by then or repeated, with your inner voice is lost. So talking of long-term memory, its coding is semantic. So information in the form of meaning. Both the capacity and the duration appears to be unlimited. And we can see this with older people being able to recall lots of information about their lives, even from their earliest years. So let's consider some evaluations of the multi-store model. There is a significant amount of evidence that the stores are separate. For example, the case study of Clive Waring. He only has a short-term memory and no long-term memory. This suggests that the two stores are separate. And each store has been investigated for its features. The seven plus or minus two figure was from a researcher called Miller. However, we can criticize the multi-store model. It is too simplistic. Long-term memory isn't just one store. There are three types. Short-term memory also seems to be too simplistic, and researchers now use the working memory model to explain how we process both auditory and visual information in our short-term memory. An effect that we need to understand in memory is something called the serial position effect. Here's a list of 20 items. Pause the video, read them out loud in order, then look away and try to write them all down.
Okay, if you did that, you might have found something interesting about the words you remembered. And the ones that you forgot. That is, your recall of the word depended on its position on the list. The primacy effect suggests the words at the start of the list were more likely to be remembered. And the reason for this is your brain had time to rehearse those words and put them into long-term memory. The recency effect suggests that the items at the end of the list should have been more likely to be remembered because those words were still in your short-term memory when you start to write them down. But the middle items should have been the least likely to be remembered as they were less likely to be rehearsed and put into long-term memory, and they would have been displaced in short-term memory with the more recent words. A researcher called Murdoch conducted a study similar to what we just did, aiming to investigate short-term memory stores and how the number of items on a list affects recall. Murdoch's method was to ask participants to listen to a word list and then record as many words as possible. Murdoch's results showed that both the primacy and the recency effect in recall Participants were more likely to recall words at the start or the end of a word list. So Murdoch concluded from these results that it showed evidence for both long-term and short-term memory stores. Let's evaluate Murdoch's study. Whenever we evaluate a study, there are a range of ways we can do it. And over the course of these videos, I'm going to show you lots of examples. But one way we can evaluate is to think about the advantages and disadvantages of how the research was carried out. So the methodology. Well, this is a laboratory study with an unusual task. So let's focus on that. Lab studies are good because you can carefully control the situation. That control means that you can reduce the chance of some other random factor being measured called extraneous variables. That is, instead of what you wanted to measure, the independent variable's effect on the dependent variable. If some of these research methods terms like variables have you confused, don't worry, you'll get used to them and you can watch my research methods videos to get you up to speed. But lab studies can also be criticised. That high level of control can make it unlikely that the participants would behave as they would do in normal life. Positive then, lab studies use standardised procedures. That's an advantage as it means other researchers can carry out Murdoch study, known as a replication, and see if the results are the same. If so, it's reliable. Murdoch's task, however, was artificial. Very rarely in our day-to-day -day life do we need to remember a long, random list of words. So Murdoch's findings might not really apply to how people use memory in day-to-day -day life. We can also give an evaluation of how the research could be applied. So for this study, we can suggest that the knowledge gained by Murdoch can be used in schools to help teachers design activities for their classes. Knowing that information at the start and end of lists are more likely to be remembered, you could put the less important information right in the middle. Memory as an active process. I've got a story to tell you. What I'd like you to do when I reveal it is to pause the video and read the whole story. So that story you just read was originally used by a psychologist called Bartlett back in 1932. He told the story to his participants and then he got them to recall it back to him. Now, it'll be best if you wait 15 minutes so maybe pause the video again, get a drink, and then come back. If you're back, I want you to take some notes about what you remember from the story. You don't have to write it out in full, but make some bullet point notes about some of the key facts. So let's carry on with the video. Many people think that memories are like a recording, that you can just play them back like a video. But Bartlett disagreed with that idea. He thought memory was reconstructive. When we remember, we recreate our memories using what we know about the world. Now, there's a really important term I'm gonna use a few times across these videos, and it's called a schema. Now, these are packages of information about objects in the world, and we use them kind of as a mental shortcut. Now, Bartlett thought we use them when we recall our memories. Bartlett's aim was to test his theory of reconstructive memory by showing how recall is influenced by cultural schemas. Butler's method was to tell the story at the start of this video. It was called The War of the Ghosts, and he told it to English participants. Now, being a Native American story, Butler was confident it was very unfamiliar to his participants. Then, using a process called serial recall, Butler asked the participants to retell the story, with gaps in time between 15 minutes and 10 years. So, the result were his participants would remember the overall meaning of the story, but not accurately. 
often participants would leave out details, omissions, that would shorten the story. They also changed some parts of the story. A common change was remembering boats, not canoes. The participants would also make rationalizations. That means they would change parts of the story so it would make more sense to them. On the basis of these results, Bartlett concluded that memory is actively reconstructed and memories are changed to match schema. Now we've talked through Bartlett's study, let's look in a little more detail about his theory and his ideas. So let's start with the term reconstructive memory. We would say it's an active process. We bring small remembered parts together and create a memory that isn't accurate. A normal view of memory would be passive, that we just play back the memory in our mind. Not only do we make memories from small parts, but we change parts of memories and fill in gaps in our memory so the memory makes sense to us. This is based on the schema that we have. Bollett also used the term effort after meaning. Now this suggests that we do remember the overall meaning of a memory, but then we use mental effort to interpret that memory so it matches our cultural expectations. So a good example is in Bartlett's original study, many of us participants would change the canoes in the story to boats. So let's evaluate Bartlett's study. His research with the War of the Ghost story provided evidence that memory is reconstructive, with participants performing effort after meaning, changing the story so it made sense from their cultural viewpoint. However, it seems that not all memories are reconstructed. Memory is like your first day at school, so those with an emotional significance do seem to be accurately recorded. The War of the Ghost study wasn't significant to the participants, so maybe Bartlett's study doesn't tell us how memory is used in everyday life. But knowing the limitations of memory and that recall can be distorted by schema can be applied to the real world, especially eyewitness testimony, talking about the accuracy of memory. Let's look at three factors that are thought to influence how correct your recall is. Interference, context, and false memories. When we say interference, we mean there are two memories and one memory is making the recall of the other one more difficult. So there are two types of interference, proactive and retroactive. Let's run through those real quick. Proactive interference is when old information influences the recall of new information. Say if you move house and you give your old postcode instead of your new one. So clearly the opposite to this is retroactive interference. This is when New information affects the recall of old information. So if I was going to give you an example, let's say you had a bank card and you have a PIN number for it. You get a second bank card, but then learning that new PIN makes you struggle to remember the PIN on your older card. Now, I'm not sure if they're the greatest examples for you, um, but if you can think of better ones, please put them in the comment section. Let's move on to context. It's an interesting one. Recall seems to be more accurate if you learn and recall the information in the same location. It's for aspects of the environment can act as a kind of trigger for that information. Now, false memories are memories that feel true but didn't actually happen. We can explain them as maybe implanted. This can sometimes happen in therapy where people are asked to recall their earliest memories. Another explanation is, as we've explained, memory is reconstructive. Let's consider an evaluation for each of these factors affecting the accuracy of memory. There's research evidence by Schmidt showing that the more time someone moved house, the more difficult it was to remember the street names around their childhood home. So I guess Homer was right when he said, every time I learn something new, it pushes some old stuff out of my brain. Supporting context as a factor, researchers Godden and Badley found that when they tested the recall of information in divers, information that was learned underwater was recalled best underwater. And if they learned the information on land, they recalled it best on land. And research on false memories has practical applications to how police and law courts should treat eyewitnesses, trust and recall less than maybe other forms of evidence. However, much of the research on the limitations of memory have been conducted in artificial environments using very unnatural activities. So the findings of these studies may not really apply to how we use memory in the real world, or memory's limitations. I want to thank all my patrons for their support. They allow me to work part-time and make Psych Boost. And in return, they get extra resources. For example, GCSE patrons get digital worksheets, exam question walkthroughs, and these videos as a set of teaching slides.